Hi, thank you so much for joining me today. My name is Dawn Eckhoff, and I have been a certified pediatric nurse practitioner for the past 28 years. I'm also a professor at the University of Central Florida's College of Nursing. Today, I wanna to chat with you about your, about your child's mental health and telehealth visits. Here's what we're gonna chat about today. First, Telehealth 101, just a little information for you about telehealth. Then we're gonna talk about the importance of mental health and your child. We're also gonna review some advantages and barriers to telehealth visits. And then what you as a parent can expect when your child, preteen, and teenager attend a telehealth visit. Also, I'm gonna add a few tips of the trade in for you. I like to call this slide Telehealth 101. So what is telehealth? First of all, you should know that there are both synchronous and asynchronous visits. Synchronous visits are something that look like what we're doing right now, where you, your child, and your provider are all on a teleconference together chatting. Asynchronous visits are visits where you or your provider may upload information or record something for each other. That might be test results, maybe a glucose log, or if your child has arthritis, maybe a pain or symptom log. Also, there are different types of pediatric telehealth visits. One might be when your provider wants to talk to you about test results. The other one might be acutely ill visits. This is when your child has a sore throat or earache or maybe even a tummy ache. Now, the last one in my book is the most important, and that is mental health. We call it tele-mental health visits. Okay, now that you've had a little background, let's chat about mental health. Mental health is so important for our children, especially children battling a chronic health condition. Parents often ask me how to recognize when their child might need help. Now here are some of the signs. One might be family stress. Family stress might include a divorce or a death in the family. Remember that a death in the family doesn't have to be the death of a parent or a sibling. Some children have a difficult time when a grandparent, a close friend or family member, or even a family pet dies. Children who have chronic illnesses such as diabetes or arthritis might need to talk to someone about how they're feeling throughout the diagnosis and treatment process. A lot of times, this makes the child feel less alone and encourages them to work through their feelings. I don't know about you, but just life in general. Children really need help sometimes just with their life. I always tell my teenage daughter that her life as a teen is much more complicated than mine ever was. With social media, schoolwork, activities, and other things that children do, they put a ton of pressure on themselves, and sometimes they just need to get that off their chest and talk to someone besides their parents about how they're feeling. This last one is very important, your child's behavior. If your child's behavior has changed, if they used to be that talkative, funny child, and now they're staying in their room, maybe avoiding you, other family members, or their friends, or maybe they're hanging out with people that you don't think are very good for them, it's time to bring a mental health counselor in. The most important thing that you can remember from today's talk is listen to your parent voice. Don't wait. If you feel that your child needs help, get it for them. Now we're gonna talk, chat about barriers a little bit later. There are some great advantages, in my opinion, of mental health visits using telehealth. One is there's no travel time. You don't have to get in the car and go anywhere. You turn on the computer, you click on the teleconference and you're already at your visit. A lot of children talk to me about not wanting to be in a waiting room of a mental health counselor. They're afraid that they're gonna run in to one of their friends or teachers or another parent. So when you're on a mental health visit via telehealth, you don't have to worry about that. You're in the comfort of your own home and have a lot of privacy. The other thing is that children need objective people to talk with someone that's not their parent or their close friend, someone that, can, that they can just be themselves with. They also need a support system that's not family. And that mental health counselor can really help your child, give your child that support that they need at just the right time. So a few things I wanna to talk to you about barriers. Whew, I've heard almost all of these. Actually, I have heard all of these in my practice. One is, I'm afraid. Children, even adults, are afraid of things that they don't understand or they don't know. 
sometimes you need to talk to your child about why they're afraid and explain to them that this is a safe place for them to talk. My teens always tell me, well, I'm just going to sit there and not say anything. And I tell them, that's okay. The mental health counselor will sit there with you. And then if so, for some reason, something pops into your head, you're there on the visit with them. A lot of children also say, well, I don't know what I would say. I don't have anything to say. There's nothing wrong. I tell them all the time, it's okay to just talk about life. What did you do that day? What did you have for breakfast? It's okay to just chat with your mental health counselor about anything. Some children state that they won't like the counselor. And sometimes that's true. Sometimes children and counselors are not a good fit and that's okay. I always tell my patients, look, please give me three visits with three different counselors and you have to pick one. Out of three, typically the child will find someone that they connect with, which is very important. It's not as important for them to connect with the parent as it is the child. Now this is my daughter's excuse. I don't have time. There's always time to spend just 20 or 30 minutes with a mental health counselor. And I tell my patients and my parents, that little bit of time you spend makes your week and your month go so much better. Visits may be different depending on the age of your child. So let's discuss each of these separately. When you have a child that's less than 11 years old, you need to prepare them by telling them what to expect. You can be on the call with them and you can say, I'll be on the call with you until you feel comfortable enough chatting with the counselor by yourself. Always remember sometimes it's okay to sneak out of the room or go to the bathroom just so your child has some private time with the counselor. You might not even need to return. Is it the right provider for your child? Sometimes it doesn't seem like the child and the provider are the right fit and that's okay. Don't be afraid to change providers. The child might not tell you, but if they're avoiding going to the next visit, maybe it's time to try a different counselor for them. Now, for this age group, you need to schedule this, the follow-up visit with the provider. After all, they are under 11 years old and they're not gonna understand their schedule and the family schedule. So make sure you, parents, schedule that visit for them. Now, when you're dealing with the preteen, these are 11 to 13 year olds. First, in preparing the child, I always ask them if they want to practice with the computer and the camera. Just do a FaceTime call on the camera, on the computer with the camera and the audio and allow them to kind of explore. However, I always tell them that their video and audio must be on the entire visit with the counselor. Should the parent be in the room during the visit? Mm, this is a tough one for this age group. You know what, discuss with that, that preteen that you're willing to be in that room with them, but remind them that you don't mind stepping out or not even joining at all. Is the provider the right one? Now, the preteens always have something that's wrong with somebody. So I always tell them, you can change providers, but not more than three times. So by the time that they've reached their third provider, have them choose at least one and schedule two to three visits. That way the preteen and the provider get used to each other. For follow-up visits, there are some preteens that understand this, their schedule and their family schedule, and they can schedule these follow-up visits themselves. But always double check and see how the provider wants this handled with this age group. Sometimes they need a little help. Okay, the teenager. First of all, sometimes preparing them may just mean that you actually have to make sure that they're on time for the call. Make sure that you check their background or blur it. Remind them about their manners. I know that teens sometimes will try to ignore or mm-hmm or uh-uh or nod. Please remind them that you expect a lot out of them. But remind them that this is their visit. And remember that they're always better for somebody else than they are for the parent. Should the parent be in the room with them? Absolutely not at this age. Now, if you'd like to pop in and say hello, when the provider and the teen first get on the visit, that's just fine. But after that, please step out of the room and allow your teenager that privacy that they need. So how do you search for the right provider? That's up to you and the teen. I say the same thing I do for the preteen, not more than three providers, and make sure that you make them make a decision. It's very hard because they're afraid they're gonna make the wrong decision and it's okay to help them choose the right provider for them. Okay, follow-up visits. 
they're responsible for making the follow-up visit, just make sure that they have one. So it's your job to make sure they have a follow-up visit and know when that follow-up visit is and maybe put that on the family calendar. A few tips. So how do you get your child to attend a visit that they don't want to go to? This is hard. However, I find that if we prepare the child, explain to them what's going to happen, and that all we want is for them to be happy and healthy and to have a soft place to land and someone to talk to that's not us, that they will generally go to that visit. Remember, just one, just one visit will hook them. Now, getting your child to talk is a different story, and I will tell you that that's not your responsibility. Your responsibility is to get them to the visit. The, the mental health counselor will help them talk. They will get them talking. And I have always heard mental health counselors tell me that they have to say, oh, well, our time is up, but I'm going to write that down for the next time. Once you get a kid talking, sometimes you can't get them to stop. Now, this one's hard for parents, even me. Don't ask, don't tell. Don't ever ask your child what they discussed about the visit. If you want to know, did you have a good time? Do you feel better? That's fine. But don't ask them exactly what they discussed. Don't be specific. That's between them and the mental health counselor. Let me explain one thing though. Mental health counselors will not tell you what's going on at the visit, but if your child is in danger of hurting themselves or hurting someone else, they will not only tell you, but the authorities. They have to, it's the law. So you can be assured that your child is safe and not gonna harm themselves. Remember to always continuously support your child. It can be difficult when they are difficult, but remember that mental health counselors are there for them. All you have to do is reach out. It's been great chatting with you today. I'm so glad that you joined me. Thank you.